Mini episode 1777 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode 1777. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here today with one of our favorite FDH Lounge dignitaries, my fellow original dignitary, charter member in the FDH Lounge, Chris Galloway. And uh, if Chris is on, there's a strong chance that we're talking NFL. Uh, we've had him on for any other number of things over the years, but uh, he's been our lead NFL guy the last several years, and uh, it is midseason, so if you're putting two and two together and you're saying, well, Rick and Chris are probably sitting down to do an NFL midseason analysis, then you would be right, and uh, that is what we're doing. Now, having said that, uh, wherever the podcast is showing up, you're going to see it labeled as the NFL midseason uh, analysis, so you could have gleaned it from that, I suppose, when you clicked on it to listen. But uh, be that as it may, we're breaking down the landscapes in the uh, AFC and the NFC thus far, where we got it right, where we got it wrong, what we're thinking is going to happen the rest of the way. And uh, again, there were some surprises that we saw coming. There were some surprises that we sort of saw coming. There were some that, of course, we didn't see coming. And there were things that we knew all along that proved to be true. And uh, here to sort that out with me, of course, Chris Galloway. Chris, good to have you in, my man. Rick, always a pleasure to be here with you. This is uh, a, another season update, and what a wacky season it's been. It has been a wacky season, and uh, in the AFC, this is a thing where, again, there were a lot of people that were picking Kansas City to come out of the AFC and go for the three-peat this year. And uh, again, when we did the, uh, when you go back to uh, Fantasy Football Draftology 2024, available on the main page at fantasydrafthelp.com, our one run-on sentence for each NFL team, that formed the basis when you and I were doing the divisional previews prior to the season. And you and I were both on the same page. That Like Kansas City, the rare team that looks better in their third year than they did in their second year. Keeping in mind they hadn't lost Rasheed Rice yet at that point in time. And that, uh, again, they, they seemed like they were going to be stronger on paper. Which, again, you go back to the teams that have chased three-peats. New England, Dallas, San Francisco, Pittsburgh. It's never the case that you look stronger. The best case scenario is maybe Pittsburgh in 76, where you maybe look as strong, or San Francisco in 90, and of course it didn't happen either of those years. You and I were not necessarily looking to be contrarians, but both of us were looking here. We thought that Cincinnati was very, very undervalued because nobody was really paying attention to them coming off of that. And again, this is a team that won nine games in the absence of Joe Burr last year. So you and I were both like, hey, what about the Bengals? And uh, again, as I said to you off air, I think we both underestimated in terms of the start they were going to get off to. This this asinine thing that they do of bubble wrapping their guys in training camp, they ended up giving, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation with Jamar Chase, uh, it was a situation where, you know, that could have been worked out better certainly. But uh, again, the way that it's going here, and again, perhaps you and I, as you pointed out off air, uh, didn't exactly anticipate uh, as much that they had lost defensively. But uh, again, it's a situation where everybody that picked the chalk in the AFC, it looks overwhelmingly at this point like they're going to be right because Kansas City is there. But it's one of those situations where it's almost completely by default. I was listening to a live stream the other day on uh, YouTube that was being done. Jaguar Gator 9, one of the best football channels out there, a guy that does a lot of football historical videos. He was doing uh, a breakdown on uh, NFL trade, line, uh, de- trade deadline day, which uh, in some quarters in America is known as election day. But of course, it's, it's really uh, NFL trade deadline day. Uh, I did see some stuff on Twitter about some orange guy, but I didn't really pay that any attention. It was deadline day. And this guy was saying, weakest AFC since 2002, maybe the weakest since 89, 
And interestingly enough, the Browns made the playoffs both of those years, actually made the AFC Championship game in 89, the last great run that the Browns team has ever had, arguably. But in looking at it here, again, Kansas City by default in the AFC, there are many stories of the season, but you'd have a harder time finding the most compelling story being that Kansas City by default with the complete and utter rubble of the AFC sitting beneath them. Well, they are certainly giving a master class on how you build and rebuild. Um, I, I guess rebuild might not be the, the right word. Retool. Retool. How you just, yeah, retool is the right word. How you just keep swimming out parts and retooling. Just keeping that car on the road and, and it trucking down the road. Um, that organization right now is just, you know, they're on a heater. It, it doesn't, you know, all the moves they make just seem to all work. So um, it is something that all these teams should be studying. And, and, you know, and sort of following up on what you said about the Bengals, I mean, yeah, we, we didn't foresee the defensive struggles coming out of the Bengals um, that have sort of developed this year. Uh, and, that, and that does happen sometimes in teams. You know, some goes off precipitously that you, you just didn't foresee. Um, and so um, we're seeing that with the Bengals. They're just... They're just not that good. In fact, probably if Winston had played, the Browns probably would have beaten the, the Bengals a couple weeks ago. Um, and so they'd be in, even in a further hole. So our, our prediction of the Bengals was well, which we both independently arrived at, certainly um, doesn't look very good at this time. I mean, we knew the Chiefs would be good, you know, at the Chiefs championship game. Um, but they certainly have become the class uh, or at least remain the class of, of, of the conference, you know, a conference that's struggling, really, you know. Um, the, you know, Miami's struggles, Miami, New England building. Um, Baltimore, you know, has has some defense problems there that you think you, you realize now that, like, hey, they're, they're probably not going to get far enough in the playoffs with the way that defense is playing. And then, you know, uh, something you didn't bring up, but, you know, uh, for – you and I have both been sort of pre-declaring the demise of the Pittsburgh Steelers for quite some time, yeah. and um, it just never seemed to happen. Uh, and um, anchored by a solid defensive effort, quarterback play is steady, and there they are sitting at six and two, early, um, you know, on top of the AFC North. So, so some interesting developments, um, you know, for sure in in the AFC. One that I would draw your attention to, really, there's. To me, there's two teams that I'm really interested in talking about, mm-hmm. and that is um, Denver and the Chargers, both out in the West. Sure. All above 100. Um, I, I thought that the Broncos were going to be a train wreck me too. this year. Um, I was not a believer in Bo Nix, and, and I thought that Tom um, Payton might be exposed. And the fact that sitting there at five and four in third place in that division um, speaks volumes about what's going on in that building. And then the Chargers sitting at five and three, they are ahead of the I mean, I, you can discuss it in the preseason. I, you know, I said Harbaugh's going to turn them around get in the playoffs. They're going to be competitive. We all know it's coming. Because yep. he wins everywhere he goes. Um, I just admit that five and three is, it appears to be happening much quicker than I anticipated. I thought they'd make the playoffs. The Denver thing, I'm with you. I'm I'm I, I still don't really think I'm a bow lever in Knicks, but uh, you know, I I'm certainly more open to that than I was previously. You look at some of the other things in the AFC and you you touched on it uh, with with Baltimore that that Baltimore uh, again, we talked about it, you know, in the preseason here, how's the team going to be in the trenches? Well, you know, offensively, you're seeing that uh, having Derrick Henry there, uh, they're, they're doing good enough on the blocking, clearly, because you, you've still got Jackson able to run a lot. You've got Henry able to run a lot. Uh, defensively, again, we thought they might fall off a bit, and they have. So it's a thing where Baltimore treading water from where they were a year ago. Buffalo's doing exactly what I thought they would do, which is to be treading water from a year ago. I said they're going to win the AFC East, and I said that even before Tua went down. But I said I still don't think they're a team that can get past uh, Kansas City or any of the other real contenders in the AFC, and that's still how I see them. So 
Baltimore, Buffalo treading water a year ago. That wasn't enough to get past Kansas City. What makes them th anybody think they're going to be able to do it? Uh, and before I talk about the, uh, the, the, the real fraud contender of, of the AFC, I will talk about Pittsburgh here and go back to what you said. I mean, Mike Tomlin, this is one of the rarest things that I've ever heard of because we talk about people that go down to the Mississippi Delta and sell their soul for this or that or whatever. For Mike Tomlin to have done that, for a bum-ass roster that somehow rises up, goes 10-7 and 7 and gets eliminated in the first round like the trash that they are every year, uh, Mike Tomlin is selling his soul very cheaply, I would say, because Pittsburgh looks like they're going to do that yet again, Chris. But what the heck? I mean, he's he's getting what the devil promised him, another team that can go out in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you on their team, but this is a team that I thought was you know, locked in at like 10 or 8 wins the year, probably sure. not my own one I predicted, and missed in the playoffs. Um so they are, I mean, look, that could still happen. You know, your injuries occur, but you know, especially at the beginning of the season with Justin Fields, it felt like they were kind of getting it done with smoke and mirrors, but somehow they were just getting it done, you know, and yet here we are. So, um, you know, I, look, we, we say this every year about Mount Tomlin. Three Steelers fan, Brandon Ray, how they want him fired. They're the mediocrity. They're tired of it. And yet, here we are, every year, winning record, competitive team, a good defense, they find a way to win. Yeah, it's, it's never enough, not good enough to get over the hump on, on these, uh, well, uh, on the playoff, when you get into the really good teams, right? But damn it, what, what teams fans wouldn't give to, to living the life of Steelers fans, right? Consistently successful. Well, yeah, if you want to call it that, uh, constantly going out in the first round of the playoffs. But sure, it's more than they, than uh, we thought they were going to do this year. Uh, which I, you could say, for me, you could say that most years because I always think this is the year that uh, gravity's going to kick in and they're going to end up where you know the eye test tells you they're going to end up, and they consistently defy the eye test. And uh, again, a lot of that is uh, the ones that hate Tom on the most. I will say. Uh, are, are the ones, I think, that are probably the least realistic about the roster that's there. Now, having said that, while he's not the GM, he has a strong voice, as I understand it, in the personnel, so that doesn't absolve him altogether. I think he's part of the reason they don't have a better roster, uh, I think, with his input on it. I think he's as guilty as the folks in the front office for them not having a better, deeper roster, but... Uh, Again, you know, another Pittsburgh 10-7 and 7 season. It's going to end in tears in January. Uh, so I, I guess right now we should pencil them in for that again in 2025 and not get fooled by what the eye test tells us. But uh, again, the, uh, the team I promised here to talk about in a second, the fraud team of the AFC. I mean, if you look at their record, you would simply think, oh, well, they're doing what we thought they were going to do, uh, that being Houston. Uh, but uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, this is a thing where, and again, I'm going to bring this up here. You can also find this on the main page at fantasydrafthelp.com, our 2024 FDH NFL midseason breakdown. And aside from a couple of categories here, just three categories where they are in single-digit rankings, I won't get into all the specifics on what categories we're talking about here, but here's where Houston ranks in a number of different categories, 17, 17, 14, 16, 19, 16, 17. We thought they would be single-digit rankings, probably in most categories here, uh, both sides of the ball. They're hovering right around mediocrity in most of these areas here, Chris. So it's a thing where they're in a division that is also substantially worse than we thought it was going to be. The AFC South, I still think it's the division of the future, uh, but the future is not now. So Houston's going to win this division going away, basically by default. But as far as a team that we thought could be a legitimate counterweight to, to Kansas City in the AFC, you know, if you look at the records, they're not far away. If you look at the reality of it, even though Kansas City has not been as good as their undefeated record, uh, Houston is somehow far more inferior than the record they have. Now, are you saying that this is uh, this division is? Yeah. The end, Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> yes. um, you know, the, 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 the division of the future, and it always will be. I love the reference. I'm not ready to say that yet, but the future is not now. And you and I were thinking that the future was now. But uh, this, this roster here, I mean, uh, you know, at best, 
it's one of those things where in 2025, a couple of these teams are going to rise up. But uh, it, it has been weaker than we thought it was going to be. I, I think the regression that we've seen of Trevor Lawrence in Jacksonville and the whole thing that, like, Doug Peterson, who always starts out very well as a head coach and then things kind of inexplicably fall apart from there, just, just bit by bit by bit. Tennessee is basically who I think we thought they were going to be this year at this stage of their rebuild. But, uh, again, Houston is winning this division by default. And, again, in Indianapolis, now they don't know if they got the right quarterback in in Richardson. Uh, I thought they might have overdrafted him, but I think it's also too soon to pull the plug on him. They're torn between wanting to contend for a spot this year with Joe Flacco, which they saw the Browns do last year, and building with their quarterback for the long term. So it's real uncertainty in Indianapolis what the direction should even be. But, again, for Houston, yes. I mean, I know that they, they've had uh, various issues here, you know, injuries at wide receiver uh, that have really kind of, you know, decimated what was maybe the best depth in the NFL coming into the season. And uh, again, I know Houston's had some issues of health, but that doesn't explain everything. Like they look like it. I, I, I'm, I'm always sort of infuriated by a lot of the smart mark stuff from a lot of the wise guys in football, like, oh, the plexiglass theory, a team would inevitably, if they've, you know, gained more than this many games this year, it'll always, you know, they're going to regress horribly the next year. Well, again, in terms of their record, they're not on pace to really regress, but they, they look like a team that has regressed in everything but their record. Yeah, I think that's function of of the division. Um, it, it's not a very good football team. And certainly not one that uh, contenders would be afraid to play. I mean, you can't have a game as we had about two weeks ago where C.J. Stroud passes for 89 yards in a game. Yeah. You know, I said that personally because he's he, he, he was my quarterback in fantasy football, um, and, and he's killing me. And, and, and now if he ends up with the season, oh, wait, yeah, that was my wide receiver one. So that's how more my fantasy season is going. Yeah, um, not good. But, you know, I mean, I think with, with Diggs and uh, Stroud looking like he's regressing after last year, not uncommon in the sort of sophomore slump. It's, it's, they certainly have some issues there that they are going to have to address in the offseason because they'll make the playoffs um, and, and bow out very quickly. They're not going to compete for a Super Bowl. And so they're going to have to they're going to have to look at that roster and see what kind of changes they have to make. You know, I was never an Anthony Richardson guy or a leader. Me um, I think that's proven now that 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 was horrifically overdrafting. He had not played much football at the college level, and you see this now. When are they going to learn? You know, with the you know uh, guys guys like him and. Uh, uh, who was the kid that San Francisco overdrafted? Uh, Trey Lance. Um, Trey Lance, that's it. Now sitting in Dallas as the third stringer. You know, he, it's just, you know, it's like, well, this guy looks amazing. He, you know, he played two minutes of, you know, one double-A football, so we're drafting him third. Like, you know, these sometimes over it. Now, I don't believe that C.J. Stroud is really going backwards to that degree. Right. But to some alarm about about his game and has the league figured him out and is he prepared to put in work and do the study and, and, and improve. Um, that'll be a big test for next year. But, again, they make the plan. It's a lousy division. Um, Jacksonville is an absolute black hole at this point. And, again, I have to say, it probably points to Lawrence being a boss. But I also, there is part of me that wonders if he ends up in sort of a Sam Donald type situation mm-hmm. where somebody picks up the heap in year five or six and with coaching suddenly, hey, look, they play like football. Right. I wonder if that's where we're heading with Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a weird and a bad situation there, the way that that has uh, gone. Uh, you go to uh, the NFC, and uh, one of the big stories of the season is the fact that there have been two teams in the NFL that are giant surprises vis-a-vis being Super Bowl contenders. Uh, one is the team that looks set to win uh, the NFC East at this point. Uh, if Philly ever gets their head out of their ass, which they're showing signs of in recent weeks, maybe they'll give them a run for their money. 
but the Washington don't call us Redskins in first place behind the, uh, the just I can't even say superstar all world rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels and the way that he has played and uh, the way that so many other guys on this retooled roster have stepped up. I said to you off air that Washington reminds me of because I did talk about in the uh, in the in the preseason. Uh, preview that we did here that Washington had really retooled that roster aggressively in the off season. I think I picked them for seven wins, so I was higher on them than most people were. But I still wasn't as high on them as I should have been. Much like Houston a year ago, I was closer to where Houston was than anybody else, but I still wasn't really that close because they exceeded everyone's expectations so much. Well, Washington and Minnesota, who I didn't see coming at all. They are the Houstons of this year as far as a breakthrough Super Bowl contender. Uh, Minnesota, I was not a believer in the J.J. McCarthy pick that they made, uh, so I didn't think that they lost as much when he went down. By the way, right now, for, for all that everyone is saying that like Darnold will be a free agent in the offseason, and I say this as the original Sam Darnold bitter clinger, I, you know, Sam Darnold truther like you, Chris, I think that would be asinine. Put J.J. McCarthy on the trade block and re-sign this guy. That's what I would do if I was Minnesota. Why mess with a good thing? They got it going on there. I know Sam Darnold's not going to come as cheap after this year, but, uh, I mean, this is giving me Kurt Warner 99 shades of, like, a guy comes off the bench out of nowhere to basically do what he's doing, and uh, you've got these two teams here. And the thing with Minnesota is, It's less inexplicable in the sense that you look at the rest of the roster and uh, it was basically in place. They they had so many pieces in place on both sides of the ball. So if somebody would have told you Sam Darnold is finally going to look like the Sam Darnold that you and I have always been saying that he really can be, I don't think we'd be surprised about where they're at because of the shape of the rest of the roster. But this is one of these things where, and I've made the point to you, not to twist the knife or anything like this, but when you look at analytically driven organizations, everything that everybody was hoping that the Cleveland Browns were going to be, that's what Minnesota actually is, and they're proving it this year. Well, and the, and the irony is that GM came from Cleveland. Yeah. So what's the problem in Cleveland, right? Well, ownership, um, for one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it is that simple, but again, I don't. Ownership's not building those spreadsheets. Ownership not doing the combine. Ownership is scouting players. Like, sure, there is something really broken in Cleveland right. that you just can't cover up anymore. So anyway, we're not talking about Cleveland. Right. Um, Minnesota, right. I mean, again, we talked about uh, a little bit in the preseason about how Daniel could end up being a relation for them waiting on McCarthy, and it looked like they were just going to play McCarthy. So I, I would like just plan. They, they aren't trading McCarthy. They're not trading McCarthy. They you know, to get up there and get him. They, they're going to do the thing where they let him go. They're going to bring McCarthy, um, you, know, you know, back on the IR next year. And hope to prove everybody right or wrong, or right or wrong, depending on your opinion, um, uh, on that choice. Let Darnold walk, and and then and they'll find some other veteran that think that they can be usable for for that. I don't see him backing away from first round, top, you know, a top pick like that. Right? Washington refused to do it when Shannon went after Byron Griffin's rookie season. And said, "Hey, we need to move on from trade, and we'll never we'll get we'll get all these folks back. We've got we've got Kirk Cousins in the house. He's our the owner, GM. Everybody were like, Are you crazy? They didn't listen to him. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, hey, do you really think Minnesota is going to go? Oh yeah, you know, let's do that. You know, because it's not like they got a magical season out of JJ. Right? They got." They got a kid who's, who's been, you know, he's been in the, in the off recovering from during the off season. The only other thing I could see is if they could get him on like a decent, you know, thirty-five million dollar deal, like one year deal, uh-huh. and they get JJ for another year if they feel like he's not ready. Okay. Um, and, you know, they try to try to squeeze another year out of, out of Sam. I could see. That perhaps 
But long term, it's going to be McCarthy and, and Sam will be playing tomorrow. This is, I joke, if the Browns can figure out a way to shed stuff on the roster, you know, based on the news of the Cleveland relationship then front office, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Browns found a way to try to bring in Sam Darnold. And the irony that he could end up being potentially away of something like the Cleveland relationship then would be the first go around. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's all these guys over a period of time where I said that they should have taken them. Ironically, I said that about Watson in 2017, not knowing about his dark side. I said that about uh, uh, Goff in 2016, turn your head and cough for Goff. I said that about Darnold. I mean, I'm getting sick of being right about things that they should have done, but they didn't listen to me on, but that's another story for another day. So, you know, again. And I, and I said to you at the time, I said to you at the time about Goff that, you know, more likely the outcome there is they would have broken that young man. Sure, sure. In Cleveland. And and we would have never seen what we see today, right? Well, that's true. So, and, and if, look, and if, all, if the Jets and the Panthers and everybody else were doing Sam Donald. Yep. And it, te- and it <laughs> took going to persist over a year to fix him, then the Browns certainly would have broken it into Chris, that's an amazing point. What would make me, of all people, think that Sam Darnold would have been Cleveland-proof, as great as he's capable of being? That's an excellent point on your part. Touche, my friend. So, I mean, unfortunately for Cleveland fans, who is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Baker was for a year, and then he let it go to his head, and, you know, we saw what happened, you know, from there. But, uh Ultimately, uh, which will always be the great regret for Brown fans, because if Baker had been a little more mature, yeah. Um, in my opinion, all those fancy had more control in that locker room. Yes, we would have not seen what we saw, and maybe, maybe Mayfield is still in any ball game. Yeah, that's what it is at this point. But to the Vikings, look, they're they're a contender, right? They're a contender again. Can't say they're not. Um, they are, and 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 that division, you no, know, the Bears, as I predicted, would be the last place team. Some of them going to the Super Bowl. Um, and, you know, they they are they are greatly improved. Uh, a clue that Bears has played much better than certainly Jason thought. Um, and and that is, you know, if sitting there in four and four, they're going to be right to the end, and that's the bottom division thing for them. So a much improved division uh, in the NFC. So it's really, really a what a great job Dan Campbell and the Detroit Lions are doing. Well, now I will say this: I owe it to FDH Lounge dignitary Derek Allen to make this point that when he was on the show after Week One, uh, it's become a quasi tradition for me and him just to kind of take a look at the football landscape after Week One and. See what we think. He said he thought that the NFC North was going to be the best division in football by far, and it has been. It has been. If you've been following our weekly power rankings for FDH, uh, we also do power rankings by division by adding everything up on there and and seeing. And uh, again, it, it is as strong as the NFC West was many, many, many years ago. If you remember somewhere in the ballpark of about a decade or so ago when the NFC West was uh, as elite as it was, uh, that's kind of the same thing now. And that this uh, mid-season breakthrough that we have, again, you can find it on the main page, right at the top of the page on uh, fantasydrafthelp.com, our 2024 mid-season breakdown. We did a one uh, that was a third of the way through the season a couple weeks back. And one of the things in there, one uh, on, on the statistical columns that we have, margin of victory, six weeks into the season, Chris, it was a matter of the top four teams in football in margin of victory were all NFC North teams. Don't know if we've ever seen anything like that before. Don't know if we'll ever see anything like that ever again. Well, I, I don't think we will. I mean, that, that, is, uh, that speaks volumes to the explosiveness of their offenses and, and ability of defenses to dominate over, over stretches. Yeah, I mean, top to bottom. So again, you know, let's just, uh, before we get to that a little bit more, let's just dismiss the rest of the uh, NFC East here uh, that, uh, with, uh, that Washington will be dealing with. Philadelphia, again, in recent weeks, showing signs of pulling their head out of their ass a little bit, but you don't know to what degree that that's going to be the case, uh, if they're going to be able to hang in there or not. Dallas, I will say this aggressively, I said so before the season, uh, that uh, again, 
This roster is weaker than anybody thinks that it is. There's more holes than anybody thinks that there is. And uh, again, the early season injuries that they've had defensively, uh, that has really hurt. But that's, I guess that's my point, though. If you have a Stars and Scrubs roster and you don't have your Stars in there, you're really going to get exposed. And I said that they were going to be hurt by not having really a second wide receiver, nor having a viable running game. You've seen that with Dallas. Uh, the Giants are as uh, horrific as everybody thought they were going to be. But basically, Washington at this point just has to fend off Philly in the in the East, I think, Chris. No, and that's the fun. I mean, Giants are as terrible as we thought. Um, you and I were both very critical of Dallas. Both of us, yes. Um, and, and, and we both saw the, the drama, as you put it, very, very succinct way to describe it. We, we both saw that. Um and, and again, I think, you know, to your point, when you have injuries, that kind of roster construction just seems to be quick. Um, they don't have any run game, which we question whether they could have put one down. Um, I picked, of course, Philadelphia in the division, and um, you know, we'll see, right? I mean, I, you know, I think that they are still a team that, that um, could win. Um, they're be great here at the end bench. Well, they six, six and two. Um, they have experience, and and, and I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised that they have that experience able to um, you know, put together enough to you know to push the playoffs and to um, you know challenge Washington. The interesting thing to me as it relates to the East is the strength of the North. You know, are we looking at a situation where you know, I mean, is it Really just, you know, are we looking at basically the top three teams in the North and then um, maybe maybe Philadelphia or Washington and that's it? I guess that's what we're going to see. Yes, um, I think so. And, and and so they are truly competing against the Bears or Green Bay uh, in Minnesota to make sure that they can get into the playoffs. It's only a half game behind Washington. Yes. But I don't think you can't count out a team with that level of experience. Um, so you know, the East is the East is generally, you know, it's bad. It's it's a bad situation in Dallas. Um, you know, as the Dallas and Browns fan, um, I have spent a lot of energy <laughs> this NFL NFL season uh, focused on my Ohio Bobcats. Sure. <laughs> and, and not on and on pro. Let's put it that way. Well, I hear you on that, and uh, as somebody who uh, the last couple of years has been primarily rooting for the Dolphins, now I'm just rooting for them to tank because uh, I know Tua is not going to hold up. I don't want to see the guy become a vegetable, but I'm terrified that it's going to happen. But one way or another, he's not the guy there anymore. Skills-wise, I believe he is, as I've always believed it, but uh, not going to hold up physically. So what does it matter if you're skills-wise? If you can't hold the guy, if you can't hold up physically, the NFC North, yes, I mean, just a meat grinder division, top to bottom. And one of the things is, again, as teams advance in the playoffs, I, I always look at this, and this is one of the things that has served me well in making playoff predictions: teams that have glass jaws versus teams that have been through the meat grinder. And these teams, if they don't beat each other up uh, too much, when they get to January and possibly February, it's going to serve them very, very well because they, the, the level of competition that they have faced along the way uh, will really be the thing that proves it. I've got Detroit uh, winning the division, as I thought at the beginning of the year. Green Bay, a wild card uh, and, and, and a strong uh, contender in the NFC, as I thought at the beginning of the year. Minnesota, obviously, I have in that level right now, uh, a team that can still Green Bay or Minnesota could still win the division, but right now, Detroit, I've actually got them number one in my power rankings right now, and they are number one in the overall metric on our midseason breakdown, as you can see, which is a composite of many, many, many different draft rankings. Minnesota actually ranks second in the league right now, and then there's a drop on this metric uh, to a, the second tier, which is essentially just comprised of Kansas City. And then a third tier, which goes Green Bay at four, all the way down to Seattle at 20. So, in looking at this here again, Detroit, Minnesota, Green Bay, three of the teams in the division in the top four in the league in this metric, uh, which uh, combines many, many different uh, statistical categories, as you'll see on here. So, 
Uh, Detroit, again, I picked them to make it to the NFC Championship game a year ago. Uh, so uh, while I was not the day one Dan Campbell believer that you were, Chris, I have since come around on that. I am a day one uh, Jared Goff believer, so I'll take credit on that one. But Detroit's the team I see coming out of the NFC. Uh, but really, if it was any of these three teams, I wouldn't be shocked. That's how great the division is. Chicago's starting to fall off a bit. That loss to Arizona felt like kind of an eliminator game right there. Arizona, I don't think, is a strong wild card contender. I think they're going to have to win the West. But uh, that, that loss to Arizona is going to hurt Chicago an awful lot uh, in that because they're going to have enough losses in division by the time it's all said and done against other teams that are going to make the playoffs. So, uh, yeah, this, this NFC North, uh, if, you're, if you're just looking at sheer greatness, concentrated in one area, the NFC North is the story of the season. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's love the NFC North. Um, Atlanta will come out of the South, as I predicted. Um, you yeah. know, they're a hot, you know, that division is a hot mess. Um, but Atlanta's not a very good team. I mean, how do you lead your division at six and, six and three and your big different season is five? Yeah. That's of a good team, and they're not. <laughs> right. Um, all, all roads lead through Detroit, and, and I would agree with that. I, I suspect that really what we are looking at right now is a Kansas City Detroit Super Bowl. Yep. Um, you know, that'll be interesting because you know, we're, we're looking at the Super Bowl that's going to be indoors in Superdome in New Orleans. You know, does that provide a little advantage to it? a guy like Jared Goff who who thrives on an indoor you know, control environment like that? Yep. Um, maybe, you know, I mean, I, they're not my team, but I, I would be excited to watch uh, Detroit win a Super Bowl um, because, it, because the, you know, historically downtrodden teams can rise up and win it, you know? And and so um, I think that's what we're looking at when we look at our midseason. I, I I just I can't imagine anybody else coming out of the NFL right now. Washington because of experience and work ultimately will fail. Um, and then you know they're going to road clash. Um, and and I just I just think it's you know right now it's 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 Detroit and Kansas City. They're the class of both these conferences. I I think so as well. In the NFC West, uh, again, FDH Lounge Dignitary, Der Derek Allen will be wincing as I say this, but I think his Arizona Cardinals get uh, aced out by San Francisco in the end. I will say, again, the last two years, I have thought that San Francisco's roster has been a little bit thinner than a lot of other folks have. And I, last year I was proven wrong. This year, again, there's injuries, but as far as the ability to withstand the injuries, uh, maybe I wasn't completely wrong about San Francisco because they don't look like they they rank up there with the top teams in the NFC North uh, and with Washington at this point in time. San Francisco, I see, being a team that makes the playoffs, doesn't necessarily go anywhere. I wasn't a believer in Atlanta before the season, but I agree with you. Uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. They make the playoffs. They don't do anything from there. Detroit, Kansas City, I, I agree with you on this, and I think it's set up here. The funny thing is, Detroit going to Green Bay last week as we record this live to tape. It was last week's game at Green Bay. Folks are like, oh, inclement weather outside for Detroit's first game outside. What's Jared Goff going to do? Just fine, thank you very much. But that win helped ensure that Detroit won't have to play too many games like that in January because they are getting the inside track right now on home field. And if you got to go to Ford Field and you got to beat this team there, Good luck, I say, to any of these teams here. Could happen, because again, Green Bay, very good. Minnesota, very good. Washington, very good. Could happen. But you give Detroit the edge there under those circumstances. And like you said, Super Bowl in a dome works out perfectly. That might as well be home field for Detroit in that circumstance. And again, uh, coming off of the hard knocks with Dan Campbell uh, a year ago, was it? You've got that then, so... A team that a lot of people have enjoyed seeing be on the rise uh, in uh, the NFC. A team with uh, a, a long-suffering fan base, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, a team going up against uh, the uh, uh, Taylor Swift-led Kansas City Chiefs. Detroit would be America's team by, by kickoff in that game, Chris. Oh, I would 100% agree with you. And, um, you know, I, I've been... 
How about the job that, you know, the coaching staff in Arizona has done last year and this year? Yes. Uh, you know, Gannon and the whole team. I mean, that was that was a stunning and hiring that, you know, I was like, okay. Um, I didn't really see it, but last year's results and now this year leading the division, I, I got to tell you, man, I coach. Um, you know, he, he's, he's weird and awkward, I think, but, um, you know, at, time, at times. Um, but my man can coach. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, if that team, if they continue to build a roster, if they can build a roster, you know, moving forward, he's, he's really, really that, 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 that he, he, he can coach. Um, I mean, look, he pins me on all this stuff. Of course, he's like, you know, he's another Cleveland native, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, a guy that's a Northeast Ohio native, and you're like, and yet can't get these guys, um, you know, to some of the art to be our local. Nations, you know, he's a kid, so I really, I, I think it's uh, it's really he's, he's doing on Arizona. Well, and you look at that, and him being like you said, a Saint Ignatius guy, I'm sure that uh, he was probably dismissed very early on when he got that job by most of the folks in my Texas Hold'em league, because my Texas Hold'em league is dominated by St. Ed's grads. And that's the big rivalry in town here between the parochial schools is Ed's and Ignatius. But uh, the St. Ed's guys are having... Well, to... yes, so I got to know something. You know, Ignatius is down uh, right now. But yeah. when, when Jimmy came through, Ignatius had the upper hand over us. Yes. And, uh, yeah, the, the St. Ed's guys are having to eat it watching this guy do what he's doing in Arizona. And I'll say this, too. Uh, again, as we all say, everything ties together in the FDH lounge. You look at the fact that Arizona and Indianapolis, through the last season and a half, have outperformed the talent on their roster, given the holes that are still there. And it's a little bit easier to understand how Nick Sirianni has just been stepping on rakes for the last year and a half on and off, because those coordinators he lost, hey, turns out they were both pretty good. Yeah, they were pretty good. In, in somewhat of Sirianni's defense, right? He hired them. Yeah. Um, and and you don't lose the coordinator. And, I mean, that affects any coach. Right. right. So I, I don't want to totally trash Sirianni. You know, like people go, well, without his coordinators, he, he's not. Well, I'm not hired. He, he's got things. he got their opportunities. But, yeah, to your point, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly made it. His job uh, in Philly is harder uh, to continue to be as close as you at the gate. Absolutely, yeah. When you lose uh, coaches the caliber of, of that, uh, yeah, that uh, is going to affect your operation. But, uh, again, Philly looks to be in it here at this point in the uh, postseason, whether it's as division champion or wild card. But, uh, again, uh, they don't have the layup that it would be if they were in the AFC. In the AFC... Uh, there's there's teams that make it that are uh, going to be there just you know completely because the the entire conference basically is shite to a degree that it hasn't been in probably at least 20 years. And the NFC, uh, there is a depth of uh, really good teams that are having to fight through it. And uh, again, the most concentrated, as we said, in the NFC North. So, any other points for the uh, first half of the season, Chris, that uh, we didn't get to that we should have? No, I, mean, I, I, I think we covered it. Uh, you know, everything. I, I think the only thing I would also point out in, in, in FC West is that I was not a believer in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, I was too. In, I thought they make the wild first, card. Yeah. Um, I, I have been missing the playoffs, and, and they, they just don't look like a team that's ready to make that jump at this point. Um, I think long term they're going to go out and find a quarterback. Um, so that's, I think that's going to continue to hold them back. I, you know, again, I, I, I look. We're going to see a, you know, an NFC championship game in Detroit. We're going to see an NFC championship game in Kansas City. Um, you know, are we looking at old at uh, Buffalo at Kansas City? Look, Buffalo fans. I mean, John Gann has the ability to go into Kansas City and, and win that game. So it, it's not over. Uh, the, the dream of a Lake Erie uh, in Great Lakes. Um, you know, Super Bowl is not dead. Buffalo, Detroit could, 
And, um, you know, I, I think that what we're seeing right now in the, the NFL in both conferences is really Ryan Goodell's, you know, fantasies come through, right? All these teams at or below 500 and, you know, struggling, nothing but parity across the league. You know, save a couple of teams like Detroit and Kansas City. It's just parity everywhere, everywhere you look. And so um, the league offices in New York must be very happy today. Yeah, yeah, I, you you would think so. You know, dis- despite again the, the collapse of of the AFC, uh, it, it, there are still enough compelling matchups around the league at this point in time uh, to where they're probably happy with that. Yeah, Seattle, man, I was giving the I told you so's to everybody about Mike McDonald through the first couple of weeks of the season, but they have come back to earth. I mean, not as brutally as New Orleans did, but uh, you know they've come back to earth nonetheless. So, I, I have not seen the team uh, crash and burn as hard as they have, uh, you know, since one of Elon's first uh, rocket launches. They, <laughs> you know, you about a team in weeks one who looked unbeatable, and since then, does it look like they, they understand what the game of football is? But, yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah, and uh, again, that, that whole thing. I, I struggle to remember ever when there was anything like that, of like a team through, for, through two weeks just grabbing you and shaking you by the lapels. We're so much better than you thought we were, and you believe it, and then falling off a cliff after that. This is this is a rare one in NFL history. So it's it's been a season with a well, lot of oddities. I believe it. How can you not believe it? Those first two weeks were so dominant. That team looked like, it's like, wow, oh my God, we were so wrong. You and I even had a conversation briefly yeah. after the first two weeks of all the air and about uh, boy, we wrong about New Orleans or what? My goodness, that is a thing. And uh, and <clears throat> oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, this next, you know, seven weeks have occurred. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was. I think we we didn't give a lot of a lot of people didn't give a lot of weight to it week one because it was against Carolina and they're as bad as we thought they were going to be. But then week two, Dallas, Dallas again. It was sort of like. Nobody really kind of saw it. Again, it was it was all circumstantial, right? Dallas comes off that beatdown of the Browns week one. Oh, maybe Dallas might have something this year. And then, turns out they didn't, but we didn't know it yet. New Orleans was the first team to expose them. Dallas would get subsequently exposed by other teams. So, in retrospect, it was fool's gold, although we couldn't see it when they were 2-0. and all. But, yeah, just the way that they fell off. So, yeah, so... Every season's got some things that are just real oddities, but that's one of the biggest oddities we've seen in a long, long, long time. Uh, of, of just uh, at, at, the, at, at, at midseason being worse than we thought they were going to be. We just thought they'd be mediocre and gray and blah, but like worse than we thought they would be after two weeks into the season looking unbeatable. So just the combination of the mirage to what they turned out to be is just such a contrast. But Again, always a pleasure uh, breaking it down with you, my man. Looking forward to doing more of this uh, as the season moves along. Thank you so much for being here today, Chris Galloway. Um, always a pleasure to, uh, you know, to be on the podcast. Um, we've been doing it so long. Uh, I think it's like second year. It is. It is, man. we got a great rhythm doing this stuff. Always appreciate having you in. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge mini-episode 1777.